basically, it's basically, over the years, risk communication efforts have experienced both successes and failures. There are a number of failures. For example, this, in 2002, Swedish Reprinovite scare. What happened there is the Swedish Food Administration unwisely decided to have a press conference without being media trained. I'm sure Sabrina will raise this actually in her talk. But it importance to having proper public relations basically advising you when you're doing press conferences and handling the media. They handled it very badly and they amplified a story that to its very nature should actually have been attenuated. Shell's handling in the Brent Spar oil storage buoy in the mid 1990s, I mentioned to you these protesters came from all these different nations. What did Shell do? They sprayed them with a water can. And uh, beautiful pictures in the media, everybody loved it. <laughs> and finally, the US Department of Energy citing nuclear waste storage facilities. Here they wanted to basically ensure that we could put all the nuclear waste in, in Yucca Mountain in Nevada, because they said the Nevadans don't have any nuclear power. It's basically a bunch of desert they won't care. And it was a complete disaster. They basically measured their trust levels before the campaign and after the campaign. And they spent $10 million on this. The trust levels went down. <laughs> Successes include uh, UK food status agencies building trust post uh, uh, BEC. And they did so basically on three, in three ways. A, they hired a very able and uh, well-spoken Sir, now Lord John Krebs as the first chair who understands science and can communicate science very well. B, they brought in a very, a, a very well-spoken and a very people person, as a chief executive and a guy named Jeffrey Podger. He, he's now, as you know, the head of UK health and safety executive. He actually was out there speaking to the public and really gaining public trust. And thirdly, they int introduced transparency in the sense that all the boardroom discussions, not FSA, are basically uh, more or less, you know, webcam. The next, next point is basically Johnson & Johnson and their handling of the Thailand scare. It's the first Thailand scare back in the 80s where they acted very aggressively and took off all their pills as quickly as possible off the shelf and rebuilt public trust quickly. And then we had the Swedish ER scare where we had, we had, we had incident a nuclear power plant called Varsabe. We had insulation material going into the reactor at the cooling tank. And what they did then is that the, the Eon admitted guilt completely, saying, no, we messed up, big mistake, we're sorry, please forgive us, we'll clean it up. And they were humble, honest, open, and transparent, and in so doing, we were able to rebuild public trust on a rather quick basis. And as one Greenpeace Denmark, they don't have nuclear power stations either, just like the Austrians, they say, no, we must say, we are totally anti-nuclear power, but the way Eon had that scare is better than anybody could have done here in Denmark, which I thought was rather interesting. So why is risk communication important for it? Well, because we've had a fair share of scandals. We had dioxins in building shipping fee. We had painted blood in France. We had mad cow disease in the UK and elsewhere. We had foot and mouth disease in the UK. We had the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine fiasco. Does that come to Austria? Thank goodness for that. You don't want that here, okay? <laughs> We're basically was discussion in the UK of the link between MMR, MMR and possible autism based on very false signs, which caused the clusters of people not getting vaccinated in the UK and caused people getting basically measles, kids getting, getting measles now. Because of these scandals, and you can basically discuss a number of more, you know, you, you, I mean, Fukushima was mentioned this morning, for example, and other ones. This has led to public trust, distrust towards policymakers. It's led to a change in the making of regulation from what I call the old consensus model. The old consensus model where policymakers and industry met behind closed doors uh, and made regulatory decisions. Which was elitist in nature because meetings involved heads of industry, senior representatives from unions, etc. Where scientists had an important role to play outlining the pros and cons of regulatory actions for elites. And where citizens and stakeholder groups were rarely consulted very much of a closed doors, elitist old boys, unfortunately, network. To a new model, based on greater public and stakeholder participation, greater consideration for environmental and social values, greater transparency in regulatory strategies and decisions, more accountability of the regulator, greater use of precaution, the role of science is downplayed as scientific results are increasingly under scrutiny. Scientists are seen as just another stakeholder, but the role of the media is enhanced. Distrust of old regulators equals the rise of new regulators. The new regulators, increasingly, I don't know in Austria, are, for example, special interest groups, campaigning journalists, 
than certain academics with agendas that have, who are trusted more than the scientifically based regulators. There, there are a number of teething problems with this new model of regulation. And one issue is the whole, and people are calling for greater public and stakeholder participation. The problem we have is that the so-called self-selection process. Uh, I did a study a few years ago in the North Black Forest, in, in actually near the city of Fort Side, uh, looking at how it began getting people involved with regard to designing a waste incinerator. And what happened here, we had something, something like 4,500 uh, questionnaires sent out to the public saying, please participate every Wednesday for six months for two hours in exchange for 800 Deutsche Marks, 400 euros? 400 euros and for, and for your time to help site a waste, this waste incinerator. Of those 4,500 people who were contacted, 201, 3.5% decided to participate. These individuals had three things in common. They were A, opposed to the incinerator. Okay, all of them, I interviewed them, okay? B, what do you think? Were they time rich or time poor? They were, they were completely time rich. They were pensioners, they were students, they were unemployed, they were housemen or housewives. Politically, what do you think? More to the left or more to the right? Thank you, much more to the left. They were either SPD or they were Green. And until a recent election, as I'm sure you're aware of, Baden Württemberg was seen as a CDU, house, a CDU stronghold with a basically a, a, a high level of employment to make Mercedes Benz and among other things. And that's the problem. I'm not opposed to deliberation, but they're very clear. But for it to work, we really need to sort out the self-selection process to ensure we have a wider group of people participating in the decision-making process. Yes, involving stakeholders can lead to greater public trust. Why? Because stakeholders are li listened to and feel ownership of the outcome. Yet, by opening the doors too much, what may happen is your stakeholders may want to influence the agenda that they feel more powerful. As we saw in a, case, in a Swedish case where stakeholders are trying to stop the Swedish chemical inspectorate's uh, attempt to phase out anti-thalum paints on pleasure boat owners. When they had discussions with yacht clubs, the yacht clubs said basically the science is fault and it's wrong. The boat owners themselves, however, believed the agency more than they believed the yacht clubs. So it can be dangerous as well. Open and transparency, seen as a need, as many electric scandals are caused by lack of transparency. And to be very clear, we should not advocate secrecy. Secrecy is a horrible thing. However, transparency can also lead to outsourcing of risk communication, where publics have to make their own decisions. And for example, a number of years ago, we had that made Austria. What happened here was with an article in Science Magazine saying basically, that people should, uh, people, children and women should not be eating uh, farmed salmon more, more than once every six months because the possibility of heavy metals in them. And it turned out that the scare was completely false, that the regulators tried to show that it was false. But you know, if you see on the front page of a newspaper, people think twice, should I feed my, my sons or daughters farmed salmon tonight? That it's been outsourced to you as a parent. All of a sudden, you are deciding what am I gonna do to, to my kids. Will I give my kids this vaccination or not? I mean, what should I, who should I trust and why? Transparency leads to policy vacuums. Regulators are slow off the feet. Many regulators simply cannot communicate benefits and risks. They have not been trained in it. They are terrified of the media. They don't want to engage with the media. They feel they're going to be basically be, be quoted out of context. And uh, they feel they want, to, they want to talk to scientists not to the media. It's very, very uncomfortable. However, without being proactive, what happens then is they're, they're slow off their feet and become a firefighting. Firefighting always leads to public distrust because you, a vacuum has been taken over and that vacuum is usually filled by a special interest group. To be very clear, NGOs are great communicators. They have their, they're basically great marketeers. They have a they have very good skill set in that. In something, in my view, that, that, that regulators can learn much, much more from. Also, transparency can cause uh, scientific pluralism. What's happening here is that you have, I don't know if it's in Austria, but in the UK all the time, you have always one group of scientists being pitted against another group of scientists. So you have two scientific views. Is climate change real, yes or no? And you have two people going against each other. They get equal amounts of attention. 
something, by the way, I think is fundamentally wrong. If one person is a complete quack, that person should get no attention, but the media wants to have debate, and to get debate. And it leads to scientific pluralism, which in turn leads to basically public confusion. We call for a very use precautionary principle, and that makes, which makes sense. If people are, if regulators are concerned, you know, and, and there's a new scandal around the corner, let's be better safe than sorry. However, in some cases, over, over regulation prevails. For example, a 2002 decision by the European Commission to ban imports of groundnuts because of the risk of one in a hundred million of somebody getting a liver cancer from aflatoxins was seen basically as being far too risk averse. And that the problems of so-called risk-risk trade-offs, if you would reduce one risk here, there might be another risk appearing elsewhere. For example, what happened with the poor African farmers who couldn't export groundnuts to Europe anymore. So finally, should, should scientists be just another stakeholder? We have the emotion of science caused by past scandals, such as Matt Cow. And yes, policymakers in the past have not adequately taken account lay knowledge. We should pay attention to what publics and stakeholders have to say. We saw that, for example, in the UK during, during the Chernobyl crisis, where, it, where officials in London ignored the farmers up in Cumbria and said, you know, you know, your sheep will be okay. They only have you know, cesium-134, 137 there for a while. It won't be that bad. The farmers were right. The experts were wrong. However, by not focusing on the scientific dimension sufficiently, we have so-called manufactured uncertainty. I mentioned the measles, mumps, and rubella scare. We, are, we have discussions of farm salmon scares. We have discussions of the so-called ghost ship. The ghost ship was basically these boats that were in merchant navy vessels that were going from uh, Delaware across the Atlantic to be cut up at a shipyard in Teesside, UK, and people were concerned they contained tons of toxins and stuff. There were no toxins on these boats, but you have basically media amplifying them. So in sum, the new model uh, broadens the sense of ownership of risk. And it can work. For example, the UK Food Standards Agency is able to build trust with, with stakeholders by letting them in through the door for greater transparency. It can also fail by involving, for example, rogue scientists, stakeholders with agendas, as well as the in in incompetent academics. Basically, so what will happen? Is the new model regulation here to stay? Yes, the new model is here to stay. Regulators, policymakers, and industry will remain distrusted by the public at large. Even in countries such as Sweden, and even here, I believe here in Austria too. All the public trust levels will vary between different ministries and different countries. There's not one model fit all. What I'm always worried about is basically you have you know, British academics and consultants trying to go to Sweden, for example, and say, you know, you know, basically, you are distrusted too. No, it depends. It's a case by case basis. This is this, and with the basis on some form of scientific principles, and we're very careful in doing so. Some ministries, for example, will be more trusted than others. And clearly, it should, it should, we should not be too depressed. It's not all negative. Trust levels can rebound. We saw what happened, for example, with the UK Food Standards Agency. That after the after the mad cow crisis, their, the trust in food in the UK was in the toilet. But a period of five years, it came back because of those two reasons I mentioned earlier. But to also be clear, scandals will remain. You know, the minister mentioned a number of scandals this year. We'll, have, we'll, we'll continue to have scandals in Austria, in Sweden, in the UK, and elsewhere. It's not going to disappear. 